Chapter 16 of The Sea Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sea Wolf by Jack London. Chapter 16. I cannot say that the position of mate carried with it anything more joyful than that there were no more dishes to wash. I was ignorant of the simplest duties of mate and would have fared badly indeed had the sailors not sympathized with me. I knew nothing of the minutia of ropes and rigging, of the trimming and setting of sails, but the sailors took pains to put me to right, Lewis proving an especially good teacher, and I had little trouble with those under me. With the hunters it was otherwise. Familiar in varying degree with the sea, they took me as a sort of joke. In truth, it was a joke to me that I, the veriest landsman, should be filling the office of mate, but to be taken as a joke by others was a different matter. I made no complaint, but Wolf Larsen demanded the most punctilious sea etiquette in my case, far more than poor Johansen had ever received, and at the expense of several rows, threats, and much grumbling, he brought the hunters to time. I was Mr. Van Wyden, fore and aft, and it was only unofficially that Wolf Larsen himself ever addressed me as Hump. It was amusing. Perhaps the wind would haul a few points while we were at dinner, and as I left the table he would say, Mr. Van Wyden, will you kindly put about on the port tack? And I would go on deck, beckon Lewis to me, and learn from him what was to be done. Then, a few minutes later, having digested his instructions, and thoroughly mastered the maneuver, I would proceed to issue my orders. I remember an early instance of this kind when Wolf Larsen appeared on the scene just as I had begun to give orders. He smoked a cigar and looked on quietly till the thing was accomplished, and then paced aft by my side along the weather poop. Hump, he said, I beg pardon, Mr. Van Wyden. I congratulate you. I think you can now fire your father's legs back into the grave to him. You've discovered your own and learned to stand on them. A little rope work, sail making, and experience with storms and such things, and by the end of the voyage you could ship on any coasting schooner. It was during this period, between the death of Johansen and the arrival on the sealing grounds, that I passed my pleasantest hours on the ghost. Wolf Larsen was quite considerate, the sailors helped me, and I was no longer in irritating contact with Thomas Mugridge. And I make free to say, as the days went by, that I found I was taking a certain secret pride in myself. Fantastic as the situation was, a landlubber second in command, I was, nevertheless, carrying it off well, and during that brief time I was proud of myself, and I grew to love the heave and roll of the ghost under my feet, as she wallowed north and west through the tropic sea to the islet where we filled our water casks. But my happiness was not unalloyed. It was comparative. A period of less misery slipped in between a past of great miseries and a future of great miseries. For the ghost, so far as the seaman was concerned, was a hell ship of the worst description. They never had a moment's rest or peace. Wolf Larsen treasured against them the attempt on his life and the drubbing he had received in the forecastle, and morning, noon, and night, and all night as well, he devoted himself to making life unlivable for them. He knew well the psychology of the little thing, and it was the little things by which he kept the crew worked up to a verge of madness. I have seen Harrison called from his bunk to put properly away a misplaced paintbrush, and the two watches below hailed from their tired sleep to accompany him and see him do it. A little thing, truly, but when multiplied by the thousand ingenious devices of such a mind, the mental state of the men in the forecastle may be slightly comprehended. Of course much grumbling went on, and little outbursts were continually occurring. Blows were struck, and there were always two or three men nursing injuries at the hands of the human beast who was their master. 
Concerted action was impossible in the face of the heavy arsenal of weapons carried in the steerage and cabin. Leach and Johnson were the two particular victims of Wolf Larsen's diabolic temper, and the look of profound melancholy which had settled on Johnson's face and in his eyes made my heart bleed. With Leach it was different. There was too much of the fighting beast in him. He seemed possessed by an insatiable fury which gave no time for grief. His lips had become distorted into a permanent snarl, which at mere sight of Wolf Larsen broke out in sound, horrible and menacing, and, I do believe, unconsciously. I have seen him follow Wolf Larsen about with his eyes, like an animal its keeper, the while the animal-like snarl sounded deep in his throat and vibrated forth between his teeth. I remember once, on deck, in bright day, touching him on the shoulder as preliminary to giving an order. His back was toward me, and at the first feel of my hand he leaped upright in the air and away from me, snarling and turning his head as he leaped. He had for the moment mistaken me for the man he hated. Both he and Johnson would have killed Wolf Larsen at the slightest opportunity, but the opportunity never came. Wolf Larsen was too wise for that, and besides, they had no adequate weapons. With their fists alone, they had no chance whatever. Time and again he fought it out with Leach, who fought back always, like a wild cat, tooth and nail and fist, until stretched, exhausted or unconscious, on the deck. And he was never adverse to another encounter. All the devil that was in him challenged the devil and Wolf Larsen. They had but to appear on deck at the same time, when they would be at it, cursing, snarling, striking, and I have seen Leach fling himself upon Wolf Larsen without warning or provocation. Once he threw his heavy sheath knife, missing Wolf Larsen's throat by an inch. Another time he dropped a steel marlin spike from the mizzen cross tree. It was a difficult cast to make on a rolling ship, but the sharp point of the spike, whistling seventy-five feet through the air, barely missed Wolf Larsen's head as he emerged from the cabin companionway and drove its length two inches and over into the solid deck planking. Still another time he stole into the steerage, possessed himself of a loaded shotgun, and was making a rush for the deck with it when caught by Kerfoot and disarmed. I often wondered why Wolf Larsen did not kill him and make an end to it, but he only laughed and seemed to enjoy it. There seemed a certain spice about it, such as man must feel who take delight in making pets of ferocious animals. It gives a thrill to life, he explained to me, when life is carried in one's hand. Man is a natural gambler, and life is the biggest stake he can lay. The greater the odds, the greater the thrill. Why should I deny myself the joy of exciting Leech's soul to fever pitch? For that matter, I do him a kindness. The greatness of sensation is mutual. He is living more royally than any man forward, though he does not know it. For he has what they have not, purpose, something to do, and be done, an all-absorbing end to strive to attain the desire to kill me, the hope that he may kill me. Really, Hump, he is living deep and high. I doubt that he has ever lived so swiftly and keenly before, and I honestly envy him, sometimes, when I see him raging at the summit of passion and sensibility. Ah, but it is cowardly, cowardly, I cried. You have all the advantage. Of the two of us, you and I, who is the greater coward, he asked seriously. If the situation is unpleasing, you compromise with your conscience when you make yourself a party to it. If you were really great, really true to yourself, you would join forces with Leach and Johnson. But you are afraid, you are afraid. You want to live. The life that is in you cries out that it must live, no matter what the cost. So you live ignominiously, untrue to the best you dream of, sinning against your whole pitiful little code, and if there were a hell, heading your soul straight for it. Bah! I play the braver part. I do no sin, for I am true to the prompting of the life that is in me. I am sincere with my soul, at least, and that is what you are not. 
There was a sting to what he said. Perhaps, after all, I was playing a cowardly part. And the more I thought about it, the more it appeared that my duty to myself lay in doing what he had advised, lay in joining forces with Johnson and Leach and working for his death. Right here, I think, entered the austere conscious of my Puritan ancestry, impelling me toward lurid deeds and sanctioning even murder as right conduct. I dwelled upon the idea. It would be a most moral act to rid the world of such a monster. Humanity would be better and happier for it, life fairer and sweeter. I pondered it long, lying sleepless in my bunk and reviewing in endless procession the facts of the situation. I talked with Johnson and Leach during the night watches when Wolf Larsen was below. Both men had lost hope. Johnson, because of temperamental despondency, Leach, because he had beaten himself out in the vain struggle and was exhausted. But he caught my hand in a passionate grip one night, saying, I think you're square, Mr. Van Wyden, but stay where you are and keep your mouth shut. Say nothing but saw wood. We're dead men, I know it, but all the same you might be able to do us a favor sometime when we need it damn bad. It was only next day when Wainwright Island loomed to windward close abeam that Wolf Larsen opened his mouth in prophecy. He had attacked Johnson, been attacked by Leach, and had just finished whipping the pair of them. Leach, he said, you know I'm going to kill you some time or other, don't you? A snarl was the answer. And as for you, Johnson, you'll get so tired of life before I'm through with you that you'll fling yourself over the side. See if you don't. That's a suggestion, he added in an aside to me. I bet you a month's pay he acts upon it. I had cherished a hope that his victims would find an opportunity to escape while filling our water barrels, but Wolf Larsen had selected his spot well. The ghost lay half a mile beyond the surf line of a lonely beach. Here debauched a deep gorge with precipitous volcanic walls which no man could scale. And here, under his direct supervision, for he went ashore himself, Leach and Johnson filled the small casks and rolled them down to the beach. They had no chance to make a break for liberty in one of the boats. Harrison and Kelly, however, made such an attempt. They composed one of the boat's crews, and their task was to ply between the schooner and the shore, carrying a single cask each trip. Just before dinner, starting for the beach with an empty barrel, they altered their course and bore away to the left to round the promontory which jutted into the sea between them and Liberty. Beyond its foaming base lay the pretty villages of the Japanese colonists and smiling valleys which penetrated deep into the interior. Once in the fastnesses they promised and the two men could defy Wolf Larsen. I had observed Henderson and Smoke loitering about the deck all morning, and I now learned why they were there. Procuring their rifles, they opened fire, in a leisurely manner, upon the deserters. It was a cold-blooded exhibition of marksmanship. At first their bullets zipped harmlessly along the surface of the water on either side the boat, but as the men continued to pull lustily, they struck closer and closer. Now, watch me take Kelly's right oar, Smoke said, drawing a more careful aim. I was looking through the glasses, and I saw the oar blade shatter as he shot. Henderson duplicated it, selecting Harrison's right oar. The boat slewed around. The two remaining oars were quickly broken. The men tried to row with the splinters and had them shot out of their hands. Kelly ripped up a bottom board and began paddling, but dropped it with a cry of pain as its splinters drove into his hands. Then they gave up, letting the boat drift, till a second boat sent from shore by Wolf Larsen took them in tow and brought them aboard. Late that afternoon we hove up anchor and got away. Nothing was before us but the three or four months hunting on the sealing grounds. The outlook was black indeed, and I went about my work with a heavy heart. An almost funereal gloom seemed to have descended upon the ghost. Wolf Larsen had taken to his bunk with one of his strange, splitting headaches. 
Harrison stood listlessly at the wheel, half supporting himself by it, as though wearied by the weight of his flesh. The rest of the men were morose and silent. I came upon Kelly crouching to the lee of the forecastle scuttle, his head on his knees, his arms about his head, in an attitude of unutterable despondency. Johnson I found lying full length on the forecastle head, staring at the troubled churn of the forefoot, and I remembered with horror the suggestion Wolf Larsen had made. It seemed likely to bear fruit. I tried to break in on the man's morbid thoughts by calling him away, but he smiled sadly at me and refused to obey. Leach approached me as I returned aft. "'I want to ask you a favor, Mr. Van Wyden,' he said. "'If it's your luck to ever make Frisco once more, will you hunt up Matt McCarthy? He's my old man. He lives on the hill back of the Mayfair Bakery, running a cobbler's shop that everybody knows, and you'll have no trouble.' Tell him I live to be sorry for the trouble I brought him, and the things I done, and... And just tell him God bless him for me. I nodded my head, but said, We'll all win back to San Francisco, Leach, and you'll be with me when I go to see Matt McCarthy. I'd like to believe you, he answered, shaking my hand, but I can't. Wolf Larson'll do for me, I know it, and all I can hope is he'll do it quick. And as he left me, I was aware of the same desire at my heart. Since it was to be done, let it be done with dispatch. The general gloom had gathered me into its folds. The worst appeared inevitable, and as I paced the deck hour after hour, I found myself afflicted with Wolf Larsen's repulsive ideas. What was it all about? Where was the grandeur of life that it should permit such wanton destruction of human souls? It was a cheap and sordid thing, after all, this life, and the sooner over, the better. Over and done with. I, too, leaned upon the rail and gazed longingly into the sea, with the certainty that sooner or later I should be sinking down, down, through the cool green depths of its oblivion. End of chapter 16